Welcome to the 1031 Exchange Passive Income and Investment Series. This show is brought to you by 1031navigator.com. 1031 Navigator is the best way to plan, execute, and complete your 1031 exchange with peace of mind and confidence while saving you both time and money. Hi, everybody. Thomas Morgan here with 1031navigator.com, and I'm excited to actually have an in-person interview today here at my office in Carbondale, Aaron Crowley from Asset Preservation, Inc. Aaron was up here teaching a class for Colwell Banker, uh, the Aspen Roaring Fork area, and was kind enough to stop by my office to answer some questions about 1031s. Hi, Aaron. Hi, Thomas. Thank you for having me here. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for coming. I I always do this remote, so it's fun to uh, be be able to look across from you. And, and do it in person. So tell us a little bit about the class you were just teaching. You know, they, there was at least 40 brokers, all with the Coldwell Bank and Banker Mason Morris, and they came from, they really came from all regions. I had one from Delta, as far away as Delta, and, and um, Basalt, obviously Aspen, Snowmass, those whole areas. So it was great. And it's in this area, you do, a, there's a lot of exchanges because there's a lot of invest, investment properties. And there's a lot of money, and so it's a brilliant place to do exchanges. And uh, like I said, I, I do quite a few up here. This is one of my most busiest areas um, next to Denver. And Asset Preservation, Inc. is a national qualified intermediary. Right. We're national. We're, we're based in California. We also have an office in New York. And then we've got offices all over the country. So really, we can we can facilitate an exchange from any place in the country to any other place in the country. Um, 1031 exchanges are only domestic, so we actually can facilitate exchanges if you're going from one country to another, but you can't go outside the United States with your exchanges, and you can't come in from another country into exchanges. But we've done them from England to Singapore or from China to Canada. So, um, yeah, we're, we're I guess we're national slash international. Okay, and your, your main office is in California with another office in New York and 20 or so division representatives around the country. Right, right. All over okay. the country. Okay, great. And, and what's the website or 800 number for everyone if they want to talk to you about QI, Qualified Intermediary Services? So my, my 800 number is 844-273-1031. That goes directly to me and I can answer any questions that you have. 844-273-1031. And my our website is apiexchange.com. Okay. It's a very well done website. It's very user friendly. You can get almost any question answered on it. If you can't, please call me. That's my job. Okay. And, and I've, uh, you know, as the listeners know, I've done 1031s all around the country and I've worked with tons of different QIs and, uh, you know, all the big ones. And I've worked several times with Asset Preservation Inc. And I'm pleased to say that. Uh, they're very professional and do a great job, and I think their your blog and your content you produce is top notch. Also, Thank you. we work very hard on that. So I, I highly recommend that people go to the website and check it out. Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to do one whole episode, and these are the top 1031 questions I get either through my website or people you know when I'm on the phone with people. And they're just starting out doing a 1031, what they ask. So okay. they're going to range from easy to intermediate to advanced. Perfect. And for all the listeners out there, uh, this is going to be the whole episode, but we're going to chop them up into smaller episodes. So if people want to get some tidbits just on one question, they can go to just that episode. Or if they want to refer back to the, the big episode, the, you know, the longer episode, they can. Perfect. I'm just going to ask the question. And then Aaron and I are going to talk about it and hopefully answer your questions. <laughs> so, and, and again, uh, for everyone listening, you can always go to 1031navigator.com slash ask to ask your own 1031 exchange question. And I'd be happy to answer them on air, or maybe we could even refer them to, to Aaron or API and get some more specific answers. So we're going to start at the beginning, Aaron. How do 1031 exchanges work? That is a very broad question. So I'll do it. the reason that we have it in the code, and it's it's coming on a hundred years that it's been put into the code. It's put in there 
for the one purpose, if you have continuity of investment and you're not putting money in your pocket and you're reinvesting into trader business or something held for investment, the IRS has given us this, this taxpayer friendly code that says you can basically defer the taxes or we're not going to see the taxes. There's non-recognition of that gain. Um, because you're not, because you're not putting money in the pocket, you're just moving into another property. So the purpose of it is to really drive industry, dr- keep driving people to reinvest in their businesses, in their, in their country. It's, it's only allowable in the United States just to keep moving the economy forward and moving industry forward. So that's the purpose of it. It works by allowing you to follow a certain set of rules and taking the gain from one property and basically defer it into the gain of another property. And it can be deferred almost indefinitely. We call it defer until you die or exchange until you expire. Or I say kick the can down the road (laughs) until you kick the can because you're literally just moving it from property to property. So it's so brilliant for people who are building investment portfolios because the ability to take the amount of money you pay in taxes and use that as leverage for your next property is is brilliant for yourself so you can keep buying bigger and better properties. And it's a win-win for the government because as we take our own money instead of paying taxes, we're hopefully investing in bigger and better properties, which means bigger and better profits, which means more ordinary income, which means more taxes. So it's actually um, a win-win all the way around, which is... So, so originally, the way I understand it, it was like an economic stimulus type thing to keep mo- people's money at work and keep it in the economy and moving forward. True. Way back, it was in the, 1921 was where it was originally put into the code. And it was mostly used for the for agriculture so that the farmers could go from a cornfield to a, a better, bigger producing wheat field. And if they had to sell and pay the taxes, they would not be made whole and they would not be able to get a bigger, better ta- um, field. And the IRS says, you know, Cotton, you invest, you're still a farmer. You're going from corn to wheat. You haven't changed. You haven't put money in your pocket. You haven't gained anything except on paper. So we're not going to see that. So that's what they did, starting with agriculture, ranches, manufacturing, factories, all those things so that if you had to pay the taxes, no one would be able to get the next step up. And if you're a particularly good business owner or, or rancher or farmer or manufacturer, you would be allowed to use your skills and continue to grow. So, yeah, exactly. Right, and, and like you use the term defer until you die, or kick, was it kick the can? Kick the can till you kick the can. <laughs> I, I referred to it, and I, uh, several other people have referred to it also as the greatest wealth creation tool available to mankind or humankind. And, <laughs> and w- w- what's your thoughts on that? Well, absolutely, because if you did it over and over and over, and if you look at the... In, in my class, I kind of show them quantitatively how if somebody just bought, sold, paid the taxes, bought, sold, paid the taxes, they'd have a pretty nice portfolio in 40 years. But if they took that little bit of tax leverage and 75% loan to value or something each time, your portfolio is is huge. I mean, the quantitative difference between not doing it and doing it. And you can do as many, when your questions, you can do it as many times as you want. You need to hold those properties for investment, but if you have 20 properties, you can do 20 exchanges, um, and you can continue to do them over and over and over. So by the time you continue to build, and then we still have a step up in basis. So that's why I said when you die, you've built a lot of, you've built up a portfolio using the leverage each time. You've got a lot of gain, but when it passes to your heirs, they're going to get it at a step up in basis. So all that gain from 10 years, two years, 40 years goes away. Right. Okay. And, and one of the questions I wanted to ask was some of the biggest 1031 exchange misconceptions. And, you know, I, and I would lead into that with the word exchange. A lot of people think that I have to actually exchange one property for another property and find a a buyer or seller. So if people have never done it before, they think True. I have to take property A and I have to find seller B who wants to take my property A and vice versa. But that that is not true. Thomas, up until the 1990s or even when the, the up until decades ago, that it was true. You you could only buy, you could only do swaps. And then um, 
I could go into long things on the Starker Exchange. One family figured out a way to put a middle person in so that you could, you could, oh, A could buy C Starker, by using right. B. Okay. So that's where the qualified intermediary comes in. So that's where we come in. And so that's why it's called a delayed because you don't have to buy from the same party. You don't even have to buy the, a, the same type of property at all. Because now we have a qualified intermediary in the middle, we're, we're the B so that you can go from A to C without, without, um, having to have, have somebody in the middle. So that's why they created this position so that you could do a delayed, not simultaneous, doesn't have to swap across the table. You've got 180 days. No one thinks that's long enough, but that's what you have. And you can buy property. You can sell in California, buy in New York. You can sell a ranch in, in Carbondale and buy a, an office building in Chicago. Doesn't have to be the same person. Doesn't have to be, but what we are matching, what we're trying to find is that continuity of investment. So if I have a million dollar building in, in Carbondale, I need to replace that with a million dollars worth of something. It can be graveyard sites in Tennessee. It can be uh, storage units in, in Iowa. It doesn't matter where it is, but I need to replace that. So I'm still, I, I continue that, that continuity. I haven't changed. Um, I'm still an investor. I'm just now, instead of investing in ranch land, I'm investing in office buildings. I'm investing in triple net. I'm investing in residential. Aaron, you bring up a couple of different key words I, I want to drill in, down on. And, and maybe the question is how many types of 1031s are there? Like you mentioned a simultaneous exchange, a delayed exchange, and then I'm going to add a third one, a reverse exchange. How, how many types would you say there are? It depends on, on how you name them. But I said the first one is a swap, and that is every now and then you will find somebody who wants what somebody else has. The prices are about the same, and they literally swap. That's is that called a, the an same automatic as a, exchange. As a simultaneous? It, it should be the same as a simultaneous, but we use the words a little different. Okay. We call that, a, I call it an automatic exchange. You don't need a qualified intermediary. You're swapping deeds across the table. You do have to fill out an 8824, but it is an automatic exchange, okay. right? However, once you have a third party involved, if the people are not the same or the or there's boot, there's extra money, so the, the, the values are not quite the same, then you need to get a qualified in the media in the middle. So we call a simultaneous to uh, us one step through. Is, okay. if, is if you close in the morning on one property and you close in the afternoon on your replacement property, in, in the QI world, we call that a simultaneous because it's one day or maybe it's going to happen within a few days. Okay. So we're going to handle the money differently than we would, but it's still a delayed exchange to the IRS because... They have 180 days to do it. They are dealing with different people, so it's not an automatic, and we must be in the middle. So even though you're selling in the morning, buying in the afternoon, if you don't have the exchange agreement in place, you haven't done an exchange. Okay. okay? So that's what we call a, a simultaneous. A delayed exchange is sell 180 days, you must buy. So I'll, I'll go through the timing real quick since that's a good segue. In a delayed exchange, from the day you sell, you, you sell on your relinquished property, the one you're selling, that starts the clock. That's day zero. You count 45 calendar days, and that's your identification period until midnight. So by midnight, 45 calendar days, that's when you must give the qualified intermediary a list of the properties that you're going to choose from. And then you still have another 135 from that day, not another 180, 135. Right. So the complete time is 180. First 45 are key because that's identification, but then you don't have to, you still have 135 to close it. There is one caveat that will close that gap, and that is the IRS says that the earlier of either the 180th day or the day that you pay your taxes or the day the taxes are due in the year of your exchange is the time that cuts off that, that date. So anytime you close, if you close we're after October 15th in 2019 and you haven't, and you're not purchasing your property until you have actually through April, or if you say you closed in mid December, you have until mid summer to close. But if you paid your taxes April 15th or they're due and you didn't extend, you just shut off that date. So the 180 is can be shorter. So, so you need to file an extension you if you to, want to use the full 180 days. Exactly. And you don't get until October, like your extension, you just get your full 180 days. So you want to be really careful that you complete your exchange 
before you pay your taxes or before your taxes are due and if you have to extend because there's no there's no mercy on that. Okay. And then the, the next type, a reverse exchange, could you explain that? Sure. In, in your area, I find that more often because you have such unique properties, there's going to be times when your exchangers get in a situation where the property they want as a replacement property needs to be purchased prior to when they've sold their relinquished properties. They can't, you cannot do an exchange. You cannot buy from a related party. Therefore, you cannot buy from yourself. So in order to do a reverse exchange, the qualified intermediary, actually, we call it a parking arrangement. We actually park title. We create an entity. We park title on that property. The exchanger funds it because we're not going to come out of pocket. They're going to fund it with their own money and, and we're going to park title. So we've got a department and that's all they do a reverse and improvement exchanges because somebody's giving us millions of dollars to put our name on a, on a property. You better make sure that we are doing it right. All of our paperwork is right and that we're, um, uh, you know, we've got everything in place correctly. So a reverse allows you to buy the property that you want to have even before you've sold. However, you still have that 180 days. We can only hold it for 180 days. So your relinquished property needs to sell within 180 days. Worst case, I mean, what happens then we transfer it, you own two properties. So that, so we do a lot when you, when you're in that situation of this is the property we need. If it's a business, if it's some, if it's just the, a rare property, you need it. The, the issues are you're going, if you, if it's cash, no problem. You still need to take all the cash from the Lincoln's property into that replacement property. Still needs to be equal to or greater than essentially. But what we find as a, as a, a challenge is finding a lender who you're going to say, I need $2 million to buy this property. Oh, by the way, I won't be on title. An LLC, an entity that I'm not part of, will be holding title, at least until I sell this. Many, many banks won't do that. If they need to sell it, they won't do that. The portfolio lenders may, but it's something very crucial for the exchangers to get that lending piece in place prior to doing a reverse. Right. That can... And how do you typically counter that with by saying you're bonded or insured? You, you know, you're taking title... In to the, the to the lender, yeah, to, to the lender, yeah. If, the only way to counter it is is to have a the exchanger to have a good relationship with the lender so that they understand that this LLC is essentially the the exchanger it's, and it's that just a are, placeholder. It's yeah. just a placeholder. Mm-hmm. So when we get them to understand that, but if they're some of the bigger banks, they're not. It's not going to fit into their their box, their model, right? Their model. So so. Reverses are most easily done with cash, line of credit, something else. Um, we do a lot of bridge loans. We see a lot of uh, hard money lending. Uh, you know, it's it's not they're not easy to loan on, but they're very very valuable to do. Okay. Because you now get to buy the property you want, and still have the timing that you need to sell the property. So again, only the one eighty days. You don't get any any longer just because it's a reverse. But you don't have to worry about the forty five. Okay. And, you know, one thing I see in my business is people have very good assets or things they've owned for a long time, let's say downtown San Francisco or downtown LA or New York City, and they don't want to sell unless they know they can find Correct. a superb replacement property. So that's where reverses come into play, where they could actually go buy the replacement property first, and then they already have a buyer lined up on the back end for their trophy property that they're selling. True. And they, and they can do that. And when people cannot do it, reverses take, they're more expensive and they take more time. We need time to set up the entity, time to get the paperwork in place. I can do a delayed within two hours. If you're sitting at the closing table, you call me, I can get it done. I cannot get a Great. reverse done that quickly. <laughs> so we need, we need two to, ha- to three weeks to get it done. But you can also use negotiation. If a reverse is not going to work for your clients, you know, I, I, I tell people, instead of paying me, why don't you go hard on some earnest money? Why don't you see if you can't extend your time out? Could you give an incentive on the purchase, on the sale? Is there, is there ways with your, with your broker's good negotiation skills? Because if you can just close one in the morning, one in the afternoon, you're still doing a delay, even if it's that close. Yeah, yeah. One thing that a lot of my clients have done is they extend the actual closing period. So, so let's say they are selling a property and they give their buyer 30 days to do due diligence in a normal commercial real estate transaction. It might be another 30 or 60 days for closing, but that seller will, will at, the, at their objective or their discretion can extend that closing up to 
100, 180 days. I'm not using 180 for 1031 purposes, but they can say I have another 90 days to go find a replacement property at my discretion. And when I call you up and say, I want you to close, you have to close next week. And that way they're, they're protected and they have, they're able to add that time period to the 180 days. Exactly. So they get complicated, but there's always one side you can control. And so if, like I said, the seller can control the timing of their, of the sale of their property, they control it. They, they, they put contingencies in. So, um, but we do a lot of reverses. And again, in this area, we're doing more and more as the inventory tightens in the market, we're going to see more and more of them. But in, in using the example I just mentioned, that would go back to a delayed exchange that would fit under that you category. You could save them and make them into a delayed exchange okay. and save them the, the challenge of a reverse by being able to do that. Okay, great. I, and so you know, we touched a lot on reverse exchanges. And for the listeners out there, I, I think we could do a whole episode yes. just on reverse exchanges. Aaron, what are the biggest 1031 mistakes you, you would say? The, the, the largest one is a lot of your, your people have heard that you can't touch the money in exchange. And no one touches money anymore. So it's, I have people who call me right after a closing or a week after or within 45 days. And it's very confusing. They think that they have 45 days, but they don't. It has to be set up before closing. Before closing, the exchange agreement must be in place. And one of the roles of the qualified intermediary is actually to assign onto the contract, the sales contract at closing. And we actually become the seller and actually take away the right to that money to the exchanger. So they no longer can have constructive receipt because they don't have the right to those funds. We do. We hold them. If for any reason they close first and they've signed on that bottom line, they're done. They cannot do an exchange. So if somebody closes... So so, so whether or not the wire has been sent to their account... Doesn't matter. Okay. So they say, but Aaron, I didn't touch the money. Haven't seen the check. It's the wires are still crossing. I say, what did, did you sign on that bottom line? Yes. Then you have constructive receipt of those funds. You've touched the money. You've received it. It's it. disqualified. Cannot do an exchange. You cannot go backwards. So you must have it in place. So I get many, many calls, Thomas, of somebody saying, I closed 10 days ago or last week. Can I still set it up? No. They, they, their you're, accountant gives them the tax bill and says, this is what you're looking yes. at. And they say, wait a minute. And they'll say, but I'm in my ten, 45 days. Doesn't matter. Right. You hadn't set it up. What other mistakes do you see? The other call I get is somebody has a property that's leveraged. They've got a mortgage on it. And, and let's say they sold it for 900 and they've got, um, they have, they got some closing costs, but they have, they've got a mortgage on it, but they always call and say, Aaron, I'm walking away with 500,000 or I'm netting 500,000 or whatever that number is. And then they think I'm just going to put that in another property and I'm going to defer on my taxes. And unless they have no mortgage, no debt on that property, mm-hmm. That is not the case. So then I have to say, wait a minute, what did you sell the property for? And they say, well, why does that matter? It matters because it's, again, the continuity investment. You've got a $900,000 or $1 million property. You need to end up with a million dollar property, not just your proceeds. So the most misunderstood is you, you cannot just roll your net proceeds in. You must account for any debt that you have on that property as well. So what you can do is take your net proceeds into a property or group of properties, doesn't have to be one, and you have to get, you must take all that money in. Any money that goes to your pocket is exposed to taxes, and then you must make up that debt. So if you have 300000 debt, you must either get a 300000 mortgage or more, or you can come in with cash for that. You can make it up with debt or cash. What you can't do is go out and get a $600,000 mortgage and put money in your pocket. So two rules for full deferral. You must acquire pro- you must take all the net proceeds from the sale of your property or properties into the purchase of, of properties or properties, and you must get equal to or greater than debt or replace that debt with cash. Those two rules are set in stone and you can't change it. So it's not. So then I get the question, but I put 200000 down of my own money, or I've got half a million into that. Why don't I get that back? Didn't I pay taxes on it already? And I say, we're doing a deferral. We are not paying taxes. And here are the rules. Mm-hmm. It may not make sense. It may not make you happy, but the rules are take all your net proceeds equal to or greater than debt. If that money, if you took 200,000 out, 
you're paying taxes on it. You're open to taxes on it. We call that boot. Right. Yeah. And that, so that leads to the next question is 1031 exchange with boot is, is exactly what you just said. If you don't take the net proceeds plus the debt that you had extinguished on the sale right. and replace that equal to or greater than those two numbers, the difference will be boot. And we call boot is just the amount that is not invested into like kind. And it could be mortgage boot. If I don't replace, if I get a, I had a four hundred thousand dollar mortgage. Now I have a three hundred fifty. I have fifty thousand mortgage boot. It's open the taxes. If I have four hundred thousand cash and I put fifty in my pocket, I've got fifty thousand cash boot. Together, I've got a hundred thousand dollars worth of exposure to taxes. Is it a bad thing? I don't know. If I have a hundred thousand dollars worth of of capital losses from something else and I can mitigate that gain, no big deal. If I have $900,000 worth of gain and I'm only paying taxes on 100000 that may be a happy day for me. But if my gain, if my boot is 200000 say, and my gain is one hundred and ninety, I'm not doing any good by doing an exchange because I'm exposed to the exact same amount of taxes as I am if I don't do the exchange. So boot is very important. We've got to look at it. And um, if there's no boot, I don't need to know how what their basis is, how much they paid for, anything. If there is boot, then we've got to go back and say, what's your gain? And is the boot more than the gain? If it is, I can't help you. If it isn't, then great. You'll have some deferral. You'll have some boot. And so it's, a, it's an interesting concept. Yeah, and, and another one that people, you know, I, I call it a misconception, is people say, well, if I had a $200,000 mortgage, they think they have to replace that $200,000 mortgage. But... You can add two hundred thousand dollars from your pocket to to get rid of the right. mortgage requirement. So you can't replace your cash with debt. You can't get too much debt and put money in your pocket, but you can replace your debt with cash. Okay, that, that's a good way to to state that. Yeah. Okay. That makes it easy. And and so that leads into the next question of a ten thirty one cash out refinance. What, what what do you see in terms of guidelines? Like like obviously at closing you can't get cash back. By taking a bigger loan, correct. But 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 a lot of people refinance the property after. What, what what's your opinion? Well, the IRS. Some people will say, "I want cash out," so they will try to refinance prior to the closing, so they they can replace it on the other side and have cash. That the IRS frowns upon. They do not like that. However, Re- refine before refine okay. your relinquished property. Okay. They do not like that. They do not want to see you doing any refinancing during the course of the exchange. But they do have what has been referred to as, I think, the nanosecond rule or whatever. But once your exchange is completed, go to the bank, pull it all out. There's no time after it. So put all the money in. So so all the money must go in there. It doesn't have to stay there. Once you complete the exchange, go to the bank, pull as much money out as you want. So so that's interesting. So you called it the nanosecond. Some, I, somebody referred to it that is, is that you have to wait until it's completed, then you're free. Because, because I, you know, I work with a lot of different CPAs and tax attorneys and no one's been able to give me a definitive answer as what time limit there is or how a waiting period of refinance. I, I've had clients that do it a week later and I have clients who accountants say wait six months or, or I've had several CPAs say wait a year before you refinance. So the most, most of the things I've read say, and, and you're going to ask 20 CPAs, you'll get 20 CPAs. And right. please do not make my statement <laughs> definitive in any yeah, way. Yeah, there's a disclaimer form, on all this. Yeah, But it's once you complete it, it's completed. They do not like you going to the bank before. I mean, so they don't want you to have worked it. And then that day you close it. They right. don't want you to go to the bank. Don't ask me why. They don't want you to start the refinance process until you're done. And, and I, I've heard that called the intent, like the IRS. And, and I've had it come up in a subdivision I've done where they look at the intent. Was your intent to subdivide the property before you bought it or after or, or during? And so what you're kind of saying there is you shouldn't start the refinancing yes. process while you're in the exchange. Yes. But after you're done, you've completed it. You are free to do that. And mo- many people do. Now, the banks and lenders will have their own time limits. Um, if you, or if you're all cash, no problem, go to the bank. But if you've, a lot of times somebody will go in with 80% equity and 20% mortgage and they don't need that. They need the opposite. But because they've already gotten a, a mortgage on that, that their lender may require a six month hold before they can refinance. It's not coming from the IRS at that point. 
Okay, and then and something that just kind of came up was exchanging with with too much debt. I've had people call me, and they they say I only have five percent equity. Like I, like during the recession or after the recession, people said I'm selling this property, but I have taxes from a really you know, I'm selling this property at a loss. But they didn't. I mean, they didn't realize it until right before they closed that they had 1031 into it so many times that there's still going to be a big tax liability, but they only have 5% equity in the, in the deal, and they, and they can't find a lender to, to, to do that. If they are accredited, if they make more, have more than a million dollars in net, that's where the Delaware Statutory Trust would come in. That's one of the only ways that I can see is solving that, because the Delaware Statutory Trust, and that's a whole other podcast, is is buying into something that has leverage, that comes with leverage, that's non-recourse, and they can take their equity and ratchet it up to the point they need using the finance. So they would be buying something at 65% or 70%, and they're not going to make a lot on it, but it gets them to that point that they need to. So there are Delaware statutory trusts and other things that they could buy that they would probably, not sure in a triple net, if, if they can actually assume a mortgage is it, that, so that a, a solution that we've done or that that's out in the marketplace is a zero cash flow Correct. deal where, where you can get in with 3%, 5%, 8%, 8% equity. And you assume yeah. the mortgage that exactly. attached that's already there. Yes, and it, and it's so a, that's exactly what and we it, would do. And it's a self-liquidating loan. Right. So there's zero cash flow to the investor. And it's really just a tax transaction. Correct. Just to defer the taxes and place so, that smaller amount of equity. Right, and that's an excellent way to do that. So so yeah, the, the zero cube and the, those are that's one way. I don't know of any other way really. Right. To, okay. To... Another term we've mentioned quite a few times is is like kind, and that leads to the question is 1031 exchange only for investment property? Uh it depends on your yes and no, property held for exchange. The the code says property held for Used in a trade or business or for investment. So that by saying that what it isn't good for is a primary home, a second home, or something you're going to sell. So something held for sale, and again, something you're going to move into, or something you intend not to rent out but utilize. So those are really the only three things typically that don't qualify. Almost everything else. So land is an investment property, doesn't have to be rented. Um, if I had a beautiful place in Snowmass and I used it for myself, my family, I didn't rent it and I could have, that does not count. It may be an investment property to you because, or to me because it has appreciated and I knew it would because I bought it at the right time. The IRS will not consider that an investment property. Only if I rented it or intended to rent it or tried to rent it and, and can substantiate that. So, Yes, it's for investment properties. However, oil rights, um, oil, and ga- oil and gas programs, mineral rights, water rights, uh, development rights, conservation easements, communication easements, all those things are also so, like kind. So trade, business, or investment. Those, those, trade, those are the, your the, office, the three words. Trade, business, or held for investment. What the IRS doesn't tell us in the code is how long does it have to be held for investment. That's where that intent comes in. Could you exchange into something, keep it for six months, three months, and and exchange out of it? You could. Um, it depends on your intent. What happened during that time? What was your intent when you bought it? If you intended to sell it and you put it right back on the market, it's not going to fly. If because you, that would become ordinary income. Correct. Because that's what you do gains. for, right. for, mm-hmm. so if you're a subdivider and you're going to take land and you're going to cut it up, you're going to sell it. And that's what you do. You're not going to get capital gains. You're not going right. to be allowed to do an exchange. If you are, uh, uh, you just happen to hold a piece of property for a couple of years. So the IRS puts safe harbors in place. Safe harbor is two years. They like to see things held for investment for two years. Most CPAs will say a year and a day is fine. Some people would say cross over to tax years. So it's a gray area, but they're looking at your intent. So they're looking at when did you put this on the market? Why did you buy it? What purpose? I mean, I had somebody who so who exchanged into a, a, a commercial building for their business. They were out in six weeks. Aaron, can I exchange out for the building across the street? I don't know. What, what's your circumstance? 
Well, we, it's not enough water. We didn't realize that the electricity was enough mm -hmm. to run the building. Did you move in? Yes. Well, no one's going to move their entire business into it unless their intent was to stay. Right. So could they prove intent? Yes. Is it two years? No. Was it a year and a day? No. But they could prove intent. So, on, on gray areas like that, when people ask me those questions, I, I say I'm not a CPA or an attorney and you should ask them. Absolutely. But, but you, you say, are they going to be the ones defending you if the IRS comes calling? And, and, and the answer is yes. You know, make, make sure they're willing to back you up on whatever advice, even if they're a CPA, even if they're a tax attorney, make sure they're willing to back you up on whatever, you know, if it's a year and a day or if it's a safe harbor two year, are they willing to support that opinion they give you. Correct. I always say substantiate. Substantiate. Okay. Put it in a file. If you if you try to rent it, show a lease. If you if you know um, if you rent it, if you put it on the market, VRBO for a year and you didn't get anybody, put that in there. So it's not what you intended to do. You're like, you know, I intended to do this. It's what you can substantiate to the IRS in writing, <laughs> basically. Right. Okay. What your intentions were. Okay. So like kind is is a Kind of a misnomer because someone will say, well, I sold a ranch. I need to buy a ranch. I sold a triple net building. I need to buy another triple net. I need a commercial building for commercial building. It isn't like that. One of my, my Texas client, uh, colleague will say, like kind means if you kind of like that, you should buy that. Or if you like <laughs> that kind, buy that. So it, it, it has <laughs> like much more to do with how you treat that property and how, what that is. Is it an investment property to you than what it looks like or where it is? So I can go from a ranch in Montana to an office building in Chicago, exchange out of that to multifamily in Orlando, exchange out of that to something else. Right. And, it, and I think that goes back to a mis misconception. People think that if I'm selling land, I have to buy land. If I'm selling retail, I have to buy retail, but that's not the case. You still hear that all yeah. the time. So no, it can be improved, unimproved. It, it can be a variety of things. And as we just said, it can be into triple net, it could be a DST, it could be into water rights. It could be all sorts of things that you don't, you don't think as real property, but it is part of the of the real property. The Tax Cut and Jobs Act eliminated the business portion. Is the that correct? Personal property. For, correct. For, for FF and E, or the personal property, has been eliminated out of the 1031. So correct. you'd have to deduct that from your sale if you were selling a business with real estate. You should probably should anyway, doing the cost seg or some sort of analysis, so that you get there's they they thought to make up make it up with some bonus depreciation, some other accounting sort of, of um, uses that, that might still help people. Uh, but yes, that, that we say was thrown under the bus in order to keep real property exchanges. So no longer can you exchange your Learjets and your art and your combines and equipment. Um, so it did, it, it, it was, it was devastating to many industries. And, and so 1031 exchange art is, is no longer. No, no longer 1031 exchange your art because that's considered personal property. Exactly. Okay. So no art, no no planes, no fleets of cars, no boats, no um, no sports teams, <laughs> any, any of those things, no longer. So it must be real estate or one of those things that I mentioned. Water I, I, I feel sorry for those people who can't deduct their sports teams anymore. I do too. <laughs> anymore. <laughs> so those, those don't count anymore. So like kind is, is great. It, it's also confusing. I, I always ask in my class, okay, if somebody's buying a, a three-bedroom residential rental and they want to exchange for another three-bedroom residential rental, can they do that? And they all like, of course. And I say, it may look exactly, maybe the house next door, but if they're not going to rent it to somebody, if they're going to move in, doesn't qualify. If they're going to put paint and carpet and resell it, it doesn't qualify. If they're going to move their mom in without any rent, it's not going to qualify. And, and that goes to the question, can I 1031 exchange my primary residence? Or, or the other question is, can I 1031 exchange my residential property? And th those are two different things Correct. based on use. Primary, no. Or, or so intent. when you say investment property, it is for investment property only. Primary homes have no, no place in a 1031 exchange. However, could you go from a primary home, rent it for the two-year safe harbor, do an exchange, buy a property, rent it for the two-year safe harbor, move into it, make it a residential, yes. Mm. So, and there are tax benefits for doing that. You don't necessarily have to die to avoid your taxes with a, with a step up in basis. You could actually move into it. Then we go into the 121, which is a primary home exclusion. That starts but but the, But generally, the answer for 1031 exchange for primary residence is no. no. 
but there are ways to do it if you structure it properly. Over time, if you're living in it now, it is not going to be you. You right. must you must convert it to a rental property, then do the exchange. And it, it's uh, similar to like the homestead exemption on the capital your gain, primary li home, yeah. living in a property for two of the last five years. Correct. Yep. That's the one twenty nine. So it's a great strategy to say I'm going to rent this property. Here's where I want to live next. Here's where I want to be be next. I want to retire. Buy the property, rent it, move into it. Now it's your primary. You either leave it to your heirs at a step up in basis, or after a certain number of years, and we don't go into the but, but after certain guidelines, you can use that exclusion. Not for all of it, but to the point of your exclusion. But but, but as a separate question, can I tend to do an exchange into a residential property? And the answer is yes, as long as you're using it or your intent is correct. Could I buy a residential rental? Absolutely. Right. Um, could I buy a duplex and live in half? Absolutely. Um, but the part that's your half is no part of the exchange. So primary, if you're living in it, it has nothing to do with the exchange. If you're going to rent it, it does. Now we could go into all sorts of rabbit holes like split treatment because you have a lot of ranches up here. If I have a homestead on a ranch and I'm running cattle, I can use both. I can use my primary home on the house and the acreage that would be associated, and I can carve out on paper the remaining amount of it, and I can exchange that. So, so, so that, that's both. probably a, a good example for like your class this morning. If someone bought a big house that had a smaller house, and they said, look, we want to come stay in the smaller house and visit our kids, but we're going to rent the big house out most of the year, then you could... What, what was the terminology you used? We call it split treatment. Split you use treatment. 121 okay. and you use 1031. So. And, and that, would, that would be a way for someone to 1031 and still be able to use part of the property. Right. Well, there is a real sense. This is vacation home world up here. If somebody called and said, Aaron, can I exchange my vacation home? I would say, I don't know. Is it a <laughs> second home where you only use family and, and friends and, and you guys go up and you never rent it? Then no, it's a second home, doesn't qualify. Is it an investment property that just happens to be in a beautiful resort area? Then yes. So a vacation home means nothing. I have to know which, uh, what it is. So can your, your vacation home be an investment property? Absolutely. So the IRS gives us guidelines and they say, hey, as long as you rent it for at least two weeks a year and you use it personally less than two weeks a year and you've done that for the last two years before you exchange it, we're going to call that an investment property. Now, when you exchange into another beautiful property up in the Aspen area, you're going to do the same. The first two years, you're going to use it for at least two weeks a year, rent it for at least two weeks a year, use it for less than two weeks a year, and we'll call it an investment property. After those two years are up, move in, never rent it, do whatever you want. But that's two years on both sides. And, and we that. could basically do a whole episode yes. <laughs> on, pri on primary residences and uh, part, you said split treatment. We, we could, in a, in a way. yeah, but, but, but primary, we just take off the table on, on investment because if somebody says it's a primary home, I'm like, okay, you don't need me. You right. have an exclusion. You don't need to pay me. You, you've got a sure. built-in exclusion on it. Okay. And then ne the next question, we kind of already touched on it, but is a 1031 exchange worth it? There are times that it will not be worth it when you are buying down. If somebody says, I'm downsizing, I pretty much know that it's not going to be worth it unless they're going to augment it with something else or, or buy. It. But if they're like, I'm selling, I, I, I laugh because up in your area, I have somebody who's selling their $11 million property. They're downsizing to a $9 million <laughs> property. And it blows my mind that that's a downsize. But in that case, if their gain is, is 2 million and they're downsizing, they're paying the tax no matter what. If their gain is 5 million and they're downsizing, Yes, it's still worth it. You're, you're exchanging three million. You're, you're, you're deferring some and you're paying tax on some. So there will be times that it's not worth it. And it, it's a very much case by case basis. And that's all based on how many times you've exchanged before, what the values going in and out of those exchanges were and what your, well, basis even if you is. didn't exchange before and you just bought property well and, you know, up here and in Denver, you know, you could buy something and it's, it's appreciating right. okay. um, exponentially. So you can make a, a big gain. And when you figure the taxes, I don't know if we have a thing on the taxes, but you've got four level of taxes. You've got depreciation recapture at 25%. You've got federal tax at, at 15 or 20%. Um, when we're talking investments of, of, of nature that the people you work with, they're going to be at that 20%. 
You have a net investment income tax that is what they call the Obamacare tax or the Affordable Care Tax that didn't get repealed with just administration. So we still have that. We probably will for a while. That's 3.8, you know, additionally. And then on top of that, estate tax. So if you're in California or New York, wow. Um, Colorado's only 4.63. So those four levels, if, even if I have a little bit of, of, of savings, because that, that tax level is so high, at least 30 plus percent, a 1031 exchange is almost always worth it. Um, so even if you're just saving a little, you're saving enough to buy yourself. I, I want to say, why are you paying me to save 3000? He says, without that 3000, I couldn't buy the next property that is going to make me 10,000. Mm. So it's a case by case, but, but more often than not, it depends on what you know, what your personal situation is exactly. and, and, and your, your overall tax exactly. situation. Exactly. Next question. How many 1031 exchanges can I do? As many as you want. So any property you can exchange, they do want that to your hold. So it's not like you can exchange and, and two months later exchange that. So, so each property you want to hold it for investment for a time. Then you can exchange out, exchange out. So same property could have been exchanged a dozen times. Or if you have a dozen properties, each of those can be exchanged. So there is not a limit. Exchange till you die or exchange, yep. exchange until you kick the can, right? Exactly. <laughs> and, and you just brought it up in, in, your tax example, but the next question is, does a 1031 exchange avoid state taxes? Absolutely. Except there are a few states that have, this is accounting. Like, like, like Pennsylvania, I think is one, right? Um, uh, California is the one that comes out. Washington, Pennsylvania has its own different rules. Correct. They've got, they've got different rules from everyone. But California, Washington, a couple other states have what we call a clawback. So it will defer your tax but if you ever do sell that property, the state will require you to keep in touch with them so that they will basically claw back the state tax that you that you had. So, so, even if so Cal- I, I've Texas experienced that in Florida. California. Yeah. And so California has it. And you said Washington has a clawback? There's a few other states. Okay. Montana may be one that has that. Don't quote me on the Washington. Okay. I think it does. But Montana does. So there's probably seven states that have a clawback. And, and it can, you know, once other states see that it's... You know, they can get their tax money back. They, there may be more, but so, so yes, it's deferred forever. It depends. But, but they're they're tracking where that money's going, and they they say when you sell and take that gain, they want their they want their they piece want their back. money back. Yeah, yeah, their their prorated piece back, depending on right. Basically, on if the property was in Nevada for part of the time and Texas part of the time, they they want it for the period it was attributed to California. Exactly. Does a 1031 exchange defer depreciation recapture? Absolutely. And maybe we should explain what depreciation recapture is. First. Okay, so when you do investment properties, you're going to have it on your Schedule E. And on your Schedule E, you're going to depreciate and write off depreciation. You're going to write off expenses. You're going to write off, you're going to treat it as an investment property. Now you're going to sell it, and maybe you've owned that property for 20 years. And every single year, you've got a tax benefit with that depreciation. You, you may have created a loss and that would have given you a, a bonus. So, so you've used that depreciation time and time again. It's had a bonus. Now you pay the piper. So now when you sell that property, the IRS, no matter what your income level is, is going to tax you at 25% by bundling, taking all that depreciation, recapturing it, and now paying tax on it. So the longer you've held a property, the more depreciation. One of the questions I always get asked is, what if I never depreciated? Well, the IRS says you should have. And just mm. because you didn't does not let you off the hook for the depreciation recapture oh, wow. tax that you should have paid. So if you're not depreciating, you should be because you're going to pay the piper at some point. So depreciation recapture is one of those that is the taxes that is deferred into a 1031 exchange. And, and I recently read one exception to that. And it, it, I don't want to go into the, the whole thing now, but that's if you do a installment sale and you treat the seller financing in or outside the exchange there's there's one of those and i don't have it in front of me that triggers the, the the depreciation recapture is due at that time so i say depreciation capture is is like a cockroach if you did the primary home you use your primary home exclusion 
and you rented it years ago, that depreciation recapture is still due. If you do an installment sale, that triggers it. So really, it's difficult to get rid of that depreciation recapture. You're going to owe it. But, but, but you've you, gotten benefits, so it's kind of a wash. But if you do a full exchange, like a normal exchange, the recapture is deferred along with the capital gains. Correct. Until you cash out. Okay. However, if you have boot and your tax rate's 20%, the depreciation recapture rate is 25%. So I'm not an accountant, but the accountants tell me that the first, so if you have $80,000 worth of depreciation recapture on your property, but you're taking out $30,000 boot, it isn't going to be taxed at 15% federal or 20% federal. It's going to be first tax at the highest rate. They're going to take that depreciation rate first. First. Okay. Yeah. So it's the IRS. And, and that's a lot of people, or, you know, clients come to me and that that's where they get surprised. You said like the cockroach, they, they just calculated, oh, my capital gains rate is 15%. 15 or maybe 20, you know, depending on where they are. And they don't realize there's another 25% based on all the depreciation they took during the holding period. It is amazing how, how that it, it adds up. Right. So if someone has a loss and they've depreciated all those years, they have, they still have a tax. And, and it, th that's when it makes a 1031 even more important Correct. and more valuable to do. Correct. All right. This is a, a great question for you. All, all these questions are great, <laughs> great, great, great answers, but, uh, this one is who does or handles 1031 exchanges? So unless you're doing a swap, <laughs> you must have a qualified intermediary. Back in the, in the good old days, anyone, well, still anyone can be a qualified intermediary. You can hang out your shingle and say you are one. You just can't be one for your own clients. But you have hundreds of pages of re treasury regulations. So a qualified intermediary is what, what we do is we follow this to treasury rules. You want to make sure that we basically get in the middle of a contract. We're going to, we assign on to the contract at closing. We assign on to it at the other closing. We basically, like I said, get in the middle and, and take away the constructive right. Um, we're unique in that. Again, we've got to follow a set of rules and there has been a, a history of bad qualified in, intermediaries. And so, during the downturn, maybe 80 to 85% of the qualified intermediaries that were in place are gone because they didn't have financial resources, because they were doing Ponzi schemes. Wow, that's a, they, that's a huge number. It was yeah. big. Yeah. So really the top ones remained. And so there's, we are, we've been in business almost 30 years and we are a subsidiary of Stewart Title, which is a strong company that's been in business well over 120 years. So we have their assets behind us. We've got their auditing, their, their standing, um, all their conservative nature, but a, a qualified intermediary can completely, there, there are still some unscrupulous ones. So it is a very important thing to make sure that you utilize a qualified intermediary that is good. Because if you use one, you know, I always say Bob's QI and tackle and Bob's QI and tackle, <laughs> you know, he's out fishing. If you need to, those dates, those 45 dates in the 180, if that is not documented and their QI goes under and you've got no documentation, you are subject to the taxes. The IRS does not give you mercy just because you used a bad QI. Because if you tried to hire a, a QI that only charged $150 but isn't bonded and, and they lose the money for some reason... Yes. And, and that's, what, that's what happened during the recession. There was, exactly. There was horror stories of people's closing funds not being delivered. Absolutely. And I still hear of them from time to time, not with the major ones, but with the smaller, right. smaller one off. So, so it's, it's like anything else. You really do get what you paid for and it's your money. So use it wisely. <laughs> it's not that expensive. Um, you're going to, if you're going to ask about and, fees. And, and, that, and that goes to the next question is what are 1031 exchange costs and fees? So ours is, they, they range between like 700 and 1200. So ours is at a thousand. We split it up, 700 for the relinquished property and 300 for the replacement property, but that buys you up to three properties. If, if you're going to be buying four properties, because a lot of times people are selling one and buying many. So, so we also split it up because every now and then somebody does not complete the exchange. They do not find a property. They don't identify anything. So we're not going to take that extra 300. But if you think about it in the scale of things, a thousand dollars total is not much. And it is part of the closing cost, so it comes off of their capital gains should they ever have to pay that. 
in, in most QIs take that right when the money gets deposited, typically. We take it from the proceeds. From the so proceeds, if right. I'm holding a million of your dollars, you're going to get back a million, my, you know, you're going to get 999 back. You're going to get, so we take it from the proceeds um, because we're holding it. Everybody says, when do I write you the check? I'm like, I'm holding your money. So um, you took it off, right? This is kind of an odd question. And I think people are doing it based on like a map search or they you know, typing it into their phones. 1031 exchange companies are intermediary near me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so <laughs> pe- pe- people don't need to hire one. Like if they're in Denver, they don't need to hire one in Denver. Or if they're in California, they don't need to hire one in California. They, they can hire whoever they think is most reputable. Correct. If you're in Denver, please do hire me though. But um, if, if, you're na- if you're national and <laughs> you, f- you feel that Aaron's giving good advice, you, they should hire you. I, I do exchanges from, from you know, I, I get calls from Arkansas and they're buying in Florida and, and they're using me. And I'm like, how'd you find me? And it's always, a, you know, somebody's brother who lives somewhere and they recommended. So we are typically national, but there are local ones, you know, that, that just, that, that are, they have a natural reach, a national reach, but they're not. We are national. Um, so you can exchange, like I said, from anywhere across the country. You cannot exchange out of the country, although... There are a couple areas that you can. So if you want to exchange into the U.S. Virgin Islands, you can. And, and that, that actually is, is another question here on my list is can you 1031 exchange into foreign property or, or vice versa? No. Okay. The only, the, so, but our territories, which are slightly outside the United States, so Guam, U.S. Mariana, Mariana Islands, and Virgin Islands, you can. Puerto Rico, you can't because we don't have the same trade treaty, but you cannot take it to go to Mexico. You can't exchange into Canada. You can't exchange anywhere else. You could, however, take your Canadian property and exchange it for property in Mexico. You could take your British property or English property or whatever and, and exchange it for somewhere. So you can do foreign to foreign. If, if you you're, a, you're a U.S. resident, yeah. it's treated under the, the U.S. tax code. Exactly. Okay. We don't see a lot of those, but so no, it must stay in the United States. And, um, and that's, that's the beauty of it. It, it keeps the dollars within the country. Another big question I get is, can you 1031 exchange into a stocks or a REIT or into an LLC? And those are all kind of three different things. And you could even add DST to the list. But, but so, so that would be the question. Okay. You know, what other things besides real property can you exchange into? We touched on those a little bit with, with the, the Delaware Statutory Trust. Which is a, which, which is treated as real property, but is actually an investment. You have a, to a fractional purchase. ownership. It's, it's, it's a beneficial interest in a, a property that is wrapped in a trust. The wrapper is a trust and you can buy a piece of a part, a part of that. Just like you can take a tenant in common and buy a piece of a tenant in common property, but you cannot buy into an LLC. You cannot buy into a, a stock and you cannot buy directly into a REIT. You can have a tax deferred transition into a REIT. If a REIT comes up and says, I want your building, you've got a trip in that building. We want it in our portfolio. We're going to offer you uh, we, units. We, we, in we, our we call them up REIT up transactions. REIT. So yeah. an up REIT, but it's different than an exchange. So it's not an exchange, but it is tax deferred. However, the Delaware statutory trust is exchangeable and you can take your ranch or your condo, or your property and exchange into a Delaware statutory trust, which is a beneficial interest into an institutional grade property. Then there are some that are part of REIT companies and then that REIT company can offer up REITs to those owners of the DST. So you go from real property to DST, then you end up in a REIT, in a REIT. throughout a process in time. And you know it. I mean, you've got to be, you're buying into those certain ones. And, and eventually you can convert that to, or it's become stock that if Correct. they become publicly traded, they can, it can, it's traded on the stock exchange. Now it's liquid. Right. Now you can sell it, but you lose any tax benefits. So can you go into an LLC? So that's a good question because we have to make sure that whatever entity starts the race or sells the property needs to be the same entity that closes the property. So a lot of times people are buying investment property as a corporation, as an LLC, as a partnership, as a subcore, as a trust. There's all sorts of different ways that they're buying and we've got to make sure that the taxpaying entity it may not be what shows up on title the taxpaying entity could be something different so if if an llc shows up on title if thomas morgan llc shows up on title that's great 
but I don't know who's the taxpaying entity because, or Thomas Morgan LLC. If your LLC is you and Becky, then that's a partnership and it has to stay in that partnership. That's the taxpaying entity. If it's just you, then it's a disregarded entity and you can buy in your name or another different. And, and something we see in our day-to-day business is, is we call it the same taxpayer rule. And if right. someone, if someone sells from their personal name or an LLC, but they want to form a special purpose ent- entity or a single purpose entity, they can form a new LLC as long as the original exchanger was 100% owner or is 100% owner. Right. As long as we keep that ownership consistent. But a lot of times someone will, it's, it's confusing to a lot because they forget that that LLC with two people in is now a partnership, especially when there's couples because husband and wife LLC is a separate ownership. So uh, when they go to buy the replacement property and the bank says, we're not going to loan to an LLC, like, what can I do? Well, or what I get is a lot people will say, Aaron, I've got a third property. I, I own a third of an LLC. We've got an office building and I want to take my proceeds and I want to do an exchange. The other two do not. They want to do something else. They want to cash out. They want to go to Bahamas, something else. So can I do that? And I say, no, because you have a personal property interest. You do not own that property. If your name is not on the deed, on the warranty deed, I can't do an exchange with you. So what they have to do is go to their accountant and their attorney. And timing is crucial because we don't want it held for sale. We want to make sure that they held it in that, that, that vesting has been seasoned for a while. They have to do what we call a drop and swap where they're going to drop out of that LLC They've got to unwind that partnership, drop everybody to tenants in common, do a quick claim deed, record it. Now we have everybody on title. Now each of them can take their one third fee simple interest and do an exchange. But with Prior the, to that, the exchange, the, the partnership could exchange, but individuals cannot. With the drop and swap, you run into liquidity issues, though, if the other partners can't buy out the, the partner who wants out. Typically. If they're going to buy out, yeah, that's different. But if they do a split, then each of the pro, then they each have a fee simple ownership. They each get their proceeds as they, they get. And these two will owe taxes and this one will exchange. Um, if you're dropping out of the LLC through the LLC, like the LLC is going to continue. Let's say it's the opposite. There's an LLC. One person wants out. The other two want to stay. Two people will make a partnership in an LLC. The LLC can go forward. They got to drop this person out. So then they need to talk with the accountant. And, and we could do a whole episode on drop exactly. and swaps yes. as well. That That's one of the more complicated things, especially in family partnerships that have been set up a long time ago. And there's eight people that yes. own it and three want out. And, and they don't like three each other go anymore. In this. Yeah, exactly. True. If I had a dollar for every time someone said they don't like someone anymore in their in their partnership. <laughs> yeah, there. We, we touched on that. Um, and, and along the same lines, Aaron, as the... Uh, LLCs, can I 1031 exchange into an existing property that I own? No. Um, no. It, it, you cannot do that, or you cannot exchange into a property that a relative owns, or you cannot exchange into a property that you own more than 50% of. So could you be a partnership and have 50% of something? 50% you can, 50-50. Mm, okay. But 51 is too much. So, so, so there's, an, there's an exception party. if you if you owned 25% of a property and you wanted to increase your ownership stake. If you own 20, well, put it this way. If you, if you wanted to buy from a property that you own 25%, you could buy from that, yeah, and buy the remaining 75% or something like that. And that's a property that you you're already own, that you already own. Because you don't have, you're buying tenants in common, you're buying the other three out. And if you're buying the other three out and you're going to end up with a whole lots of that's a whole nother subject but if somebody says i want to buy into my my brother has this llc i want to buy into it can i no you must go from tenant in common into tenant in common you've got to can you buy into their property yes but they're going to have to carve out a share of that and actually deed you a percentage giving you a percentage of the llc doesn't work you, you came out of a property, you have to go into a property. So it gets very confusing with people. They want to buy a partnership or buy into a partnership. But, but part- you have to already be structured as a TIC on the replacement property. That- right, right, because they can't buy into an LLC. So I say if the LLC will sell you a fee simple interest and now you're partner with LLC owning two-thirds and you own one-third, 
yes. Okay. But if your name just if you're trying to buy into the LLC, then no. And then if you've already bought a property or you own an apartment building and you're like, well, I, would, I just want to exchange that my money into my apartment building pay, and pay, pay off, off some debt, board, no. that, that doesn't work. No. And, and I always well, have to qualify with no, not typically. Not, not, no, not typically <laughs> un, unless you did a reverse exchange. Which, no. Which would... That wouldn't make it because it reverse, we, we're parking in... You're doing a reverse because you can't already buy it. Um, what would be the instance that you could... There are very tricky ways of doing something if somebody owns a piece of property and they want to build on it. There are some ways of of setting up some long-term leases and and doing some improvement exchanges where you can possibly build on land that you own. They're quite complicated. I can't go into it now, but but there's there's ways. Um, but but no, typically no. You're not going to be able to buy something you already own. You're not going to build on something you already own, typically, and you can't buy from a relative, typically, unless your relative is also exchanging. So there's always a caveat. That's why I have to say that. Right. If okay. I want to buy dad's property, I can, as long as dad's going to go buy something else and okay. exchange out of it. Okay. And I, I guess that leads to the question, can I 1031 with family members? You could sell to your family members. You can do a swap with family members. The, the, the caveat was swapping. If I want to buy dad's and he wants to buy mine, I can do that. But each of us has to hold that property for at least two years. And if we don't and we sell it, we're going to owe the taxes. Um, typically, I can sell using a qualified intermediary. I can sell to a relative. But buying from a relative is very difficult. You do not want to buy. And a relative is... Anything you own more than 50%, of, if it's your trust, if it's your corporation, if it's your partnership, or mother, father, brother, sister, son, daughter, grandfather, grandmother. Those those are relatives. Aunts, uncles, cousins, in-laws, those are not. And, and when you say you don't necessarily want to buy from a family member because it's it's hard to establish fair market value, is that what the IRS challenges, even if you had an appraisal? Basis swapping is what they're challenging. You're going to do a swap with your family to get the lower basis or the higher basis one and then sell that one and avoid taxes. So okay. it's tax avoidance. So, they're trying so, to so it's, it's easier and clearer just to not Correct. do that. Okay, great. Well, Aaron, I really appreciate you answering all those questions. <laughs> so make sure we have it that, that I do not give tax or legal advice. Absolutely. So this is just, we give lots and lots of information, but we can't give tax or legal advice. That's why CPAs and accountants and, and brokers are key. Yeah, and even in that case, it's it's check with your own tax advisor for your, in, for your own personal situation. Right. And in 1031 exchanges, the timing is set in stone. Some of the, the some of the rules are set in stone and almost everything else is gray. So th- that's why you, you need very good professionals. Right. And I just want to acknowledge Becky, who's sitting here with us. Uh, Becky Martin is a fellow CCIM, and I appreciate you setting me up with Aaron to, to be on the podcast. So I appreciate it. You're welcome. (laughs) Thanks. Thank you very much. I really appreciate this. If anyone has questions, I'm always happy to answer. That's my job. I I answer questions. No question is is too small. Um, We do exchanges from 90,000 to 90 million. So anywhere across the board, we do exchanges on. My, my, Eric, my number is 844-273-1033. Call me anytime. Okay, great. Well, thanks for listening to another episode of the 1031 Exchange Passive Income Series. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to the 1031 Exchange Passive Income and Investment Series. To help create, grow, and protect your wealth with 1031 exchanges and triple net properties, visit 1031navigator.com or call 1-866-539-1777. Again, call 1-866-539-1777. Make sure to remember to ask Thomas about our 1031 VIP program. You can put thousands of dollars in your pocket on your next 1031. If you enjoyed the show, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review it where your podcasts are peddled. And if you have a friend considering a 1031, make sure to share this show with them. A referral is the best compliment we can receive. Thanks for listening, and see you again soon.
And remember, this show is provided for your informational and educational purposes only. Be sure to check with your accountant, lawyer, and or other tax professionals and advisors before relying on this information. Although the information contained herein is believed to be accurate and reliable, we do not guarantee its accuracy or completeness, and it is provided without warranty. Common sense is the best practice.